What's Wales in Welsh? That's the title I've given myself. On many levels, this is an easy peasy, lemon squeezy question. Flick open the dictionary, hard paper copy or digital and floppy, and there it is. Wales in Welsh is Cymru. Anida, we can all go home. Only we are all at home already. And so I'm going to try to fill this next half hour or so searching a little deeper. Let's start and we look first at that thing we call language. What is it? Go on, have a think. From having asked this to myself and my students often, experience tells me that some of you at least are formulating answers such as it's a tool for communication or perhaps it's a system of communication. Yeah, okay. So what does the tool, the system look like? And though just those two ideas are already quite different things, tool, system, here somewhere in the mix, you're probably thinking words. Language is words. Now, before we go further, it's only fair that I should tell you that defining language is a hugely difficult task if you haven't tried it before. We use it every day, yet we don't seem to know what it is. We all talk with it, but only a few talk about it. And even here in Wales, where many of us talk quite a lot about it, we don't seem to stop to ask, so what is it? The scientists, biologists, linguists, sociologists, philosophers have all struggled with this and perplexed. I have almost given up on the ists and the ers. I even tried the poets. For Waldo Williams, language, the Welsh language at least, is the daughter of danger. For Gerallt Lloyd Owen, she is an uneasy force in the mountains. Miguel de Unamuno, Bilbao born poet, yes, but probably more philosopher than poet, discuss, said, La lengua es la sangre del alma, el vehículo de las ideas. Language is the blood of the soul, the vehicle of ideas. And when we stop to really think about it, we know that language is much more than words. I mean, before the words comes the music, the babbling. Every language has its own tune, though the tune, of course, is regional variations, sometimes quite remarkable variations. But you know what I mean. If I were to say like this, me llamo Mererit Hopwood, y estoy muy contenta de estar aquí con vosotros hoy, you would know that something wasn't quite right. It's correct Spanish, words, grammar even, but the wrong tune. It's on the Welsh tune. The Spanish tune would be something like, me llamo Mererit y estoy muy contenta de estar aquí con vosotros hoy. Or let's turn to German. Ich heiße Mererit Hopwood und es freut mich außerordentlich heute mit euch zu sein. Words, grammar, and, and German grammar is not the most straightforward. All fine. Wrong tune. Better. Ich heiße Mereri und es freut mich außerordentlich, heute mit euch zu sein. I shan't dare give you my English example, because for me at least, it's really difficult to do the English, English thing. I know the trick. It's to stop moving your lips. I mean, think of the inverse. Any English person who's learning Welsh knows that unless your jaw hurts by the end of the lesson, you're not doing it properly. And if language has a musical element, then it also has a physical one. And here I'm not talking about only sign language, which we can all recognize depends heavily on the body, but so does spoken language. Of course it does. It calls for the controlling of breath, lips, tongue, mouth, and, and much more. Suppose we could say that these are some of the things all languages have in common part of the set of properties of what we might call language. Fine. Yet we know that there is a whole other set of properties that account for our different languages, the things that make the differences. Return to Unamuno, could we borrow his idea about the vehicle perhaps and say then that all languages have a common engine, but they power different models? 
And while one of the most obvious design features of the different models are the different words, here, a note of caution. They're, not, they're often not as different as they may seem. One of the great joys of studying language, languages is discovering the common roots of words. Take, for example, the vast family of the Indo-European languages, where we can break the lockdown without breaking the rules and cross countries and continents just by tweaking a consonant here or there. Three in Wales, three in England, trois, we've made it to France, tres to Spain, drei to Germany, trias to Sanskrit, to India. Or let's swap gua in Welsh for w for v and watch us hop from Gwedu to widow to la veuve, biuda, vitva, bilhava, all the way to the east, where we have punch, ab, and back here in the west, pimp, av, on five rivers in Welsh. So, what about grammar? Well, there's not enough time really to play the whole mechanic thing here. But with grammar, if we're not under the bonnet with the shared common engine, and there's a lot of controversy about that notion, we must be at least on the inside of the vehicle, behind the steering wheel, holding on to the gear stick. Just pause to think about just this one thing that grammar can let us do, namely, to distinguish between verb, subject and object, who's doing what to whom, and how that device differs from language to language. In English, it's word order, very sleek piece of kit. A man saw a dog, a dog saw a man. We know unambiguously who's doing what to whom just by the order. In German, we modify the indefinite article, that A word, ein Mann sah einen Hund, ein Hund sah einen Mann, or even einen Hund sah einen Mann and einen Mann, einen Mann sah einen Hund. It's not so much the order, but the expression of the accusative case, that ein, here it is, excuse the props, becoming einen. In Welsh, we generally change the order, but crucially, we mutate the beginning of the word. This is chic. Gwelodd dyn gi, gwelodd ki ddyn. The dyn becoming ddyn and ki becoming gi, depending on who's doing what. So yes, this thing called language is words, is music, is grammar, is communication, and its meaning, it transacts, it conveys, it suggests, and listen to this, it imagines. It thinks, because there is a relationship, isn't there, between language and thought. Can you think without language? Yes. What about the baby toddler? And beyond the babies, consider how, as adults, the time we have had new thoughts and found it difficult to put them into language. The times where we've had to push the boundaries of the language we usually use and grapple to formulate new sentences, to paint new pictures, with the old words. But those are more rare occasions. The occasions, dare I say, that sometimes bring the poems. And on the whole, we toodle along within the same old boundaries with the language we have somehow determining the thoughts we think. As Wittgenstein put it, die Grenzen meiner Sprache bedeuten die Grenzen meiner Welt. The boundaries of my language mean the boundaries of my world. Bedeuten is a difficult word to translate. If you're really interested in thinking more about this what is language question, then I can recommend Charles Taylor's fascinating book, The Language Animal. And one of the images discussed in it is how a word in a language is like a note on a musical instrument in that it depends on the reverberations it causes throughout the whole instrument for its being. So, holding that, what I'd like to do now is to invite you to think about language in the context of a bi or multilingual mind. And quite soon we see that having two languages is not simply a case of having two sets of labels for the same set of things, which is perhaps what a monolingual mindset has tended to persuade us to believe. 
After all, I can use seat and chair, two labels for the same thing in the same language. Adding kadair, la chaise, la silla, der stuhl, and so on is not what it's about. No, having two languages is more like having two different sets, not of labels, but of things. Or at least two windows on the world where each window offers a different perspective, a different view, where different things become apparent. Let's take some examples to illustrate this point. So in Welsh, we don't say, I have something. This is not a concept for us. We don't express the relationship between us and things in this subject verb object way. That's not our view on possession. Instead of I have X, we say X is with me. My X gadavi, my geni X. I can't say I have a Porsche in Welsh or in any language for that matter. I, I have to add that every time. I can only say there is a car with me and being biased, I feel that this is rather an enlightened view. The Welsh language seems to remind us of the transience of the material. These things are just with us for now. Or take fear. Through the Welsh window, we don't see this as something that defines the fearful person, as in English, where the verb to be is followed by an adjective, I am afraid. No, in Welsh, we see fear as something that is outside of us and upon us. My ofn ar navi. There is a fear upon me. In Spanish and French, then, fear is something that we can have. J'ai peur, tengo miedo. Yes, every language offers us a different window, a different way of seeing things. Let's stay with Spanish. Here we don't say when I'll come to see you because events in the future are treated, well, I like to say with more humility. The Spanish phrasing requires a nod to an element of doubt using what's known in grammatical terms as the subjunctive mood. Cuando venga, not cuando vendré. More of a kind of when I might come. Because something unexpected might happen and make us all change our plans. Really? We used to have this in Welsh, pan velwyf. Well done Spanish for hanging on to it. And we don't have to look at phrases. There are whole words in languages that offer the speaker another op op option for understanding, for seeing. Think of flowers. Lady smock. Llaith a gaseg in Welsh. Mare's milk. Or foxglove. Didalera digital. Fingerhut. Catrish a coon. Gwyniadir mair. Mary's thimble. What do the words make you see? And then there are those words we generally refer to as untranslatable. You know the ones that when you look them up in the dictionary, you'll find that at least half a dozen is needed to help you get it, more perhaps. And just as you were thinking that this was a virus-free zone, would you believe it that for Welsh speakers, one small mutation takes us to the word govit, which we have known from forever, and what's more, known full well that it's bad news. The authoritative dictionary, Geriadir Abrivaskol, this is one of only four volumes, translates it as follows. Pain, grief, sorrow, distress, misery, adversity, hardship, trouble, tribulation, mischief, and even battle. And the last time I was here, well, there. I had the huge pleasure of joining Jackie Morris with Peter Florence to discuss the wonderful Lost Words publication because I had the joy of trying to create a Welsh version based on Rob McFarlane's beautiful poems. Challenging at times as an acrostic collection when the English is newt with four letters and the Welsh is Madabash Ledur with ten. But during that discussion the word with our well cropped up, which is an old single Welsh word, well, Pembrokeshire word to be more precise, for the sound of the wind in the leaves of trees at dusk or dawn. And then there's Torwino, one word for when the leaves on the tray, when the leaves on the trees turn inside out, sensing rain. 
And did you know that there was a word just like we have for nose and forehead and lips for the part of the face that is from the upper lip down to the chin, mimrid. And once you have a word for something, it's so much easier to see. Those have all come from this glossary of the Domitian dialect that you can get from Llanerch Press. Yes, we know more than our fair share about lost words in Wales. Almost a whole lost language of them. If we're lucky, like fossils, we can still find remnants of them in surprising places. Travel, what, some 30 miles east from Hay, and we'll find English speakers still giving their town the Welsh name Molvern, Moilvrin, literally, the bald hill. Yet some 30 miles west to Epint Mountain, the remnants have left the land, lodging themselves deeply in memory. Because 80 years to this very May, this very June, 219 people were displaced, 12,000 hectares taken, 54 farmsteads emptied to make way for warfare. It was a for now arrangement, according to the Ministry of Defence. 80 years is a very long for now. And defence is a very strange word. The chatting at blaen ysgyr fawr, gilfach yr haidd, llawr dolau. What beautiful names of dwellings. Fell silent to make way for the language of guns. One language whose sounds do not make music. And on that, let me share with you how the Welsh window offers us two views of peace, because we have two words for it. Heddwch and Tangnefedd. This latter is difficult to translate exactly because it's more than peace. It's something closer to a serene peace made. If you study its use across the centuries, you'll find that it seems always to occur between two parties, where these might be oneself and somebody else, oneself and the great being, as my grandmother often referred to the concept of God, a bored maur, or between oneself and oneself, one's own body and soul or mind, a corfarenaid, tang nevedd. And we talked earlier about words and resonance. The other word for peace, heddwch, resonates deeply in any Welsh thinking mind. It takes us to the National Eisteddfod, a week-long and vast celebration of culture each August. Beautiful event. Thousands flock to enjoy music, dance, poetry, science, everything. And where we announce the winners of the literary competitions with a good degree of pomp, dressed up in a long white and gold gown, the archdruid greets the winning poet by calling out this phrase, A ois heddwch, is there peace? To which the gathered thousands call back, heddwch, peace. And all the while, the nervous poet is sat on the enormous chair that they get to keep. And above his or her head, another two or three druids are holding the biggest sword you have ever seen. But this is the sword of peace, whose blade never sees light of day. Can you imagine ceremoniously walking into a tent in a field in any other country, brandishing an enormous sword, sheathed or not, and solemnly asking, is there peace? confidently expecting the thousands gathered to answer calmly, peace. It's not going to happen, is it? Language is context. Sharing a language is sharing a memory. And one thing we can say with a fair degree of certainty, language has little meaning unless it's shared. And memory shared is belonging. Do we belong together as Hay Festival goers? For sure. If I were to ask you to be, I can be confident that you're remembering, thinking, or not to be. For the rugby fans amongst us, if I were to yell, Oggy, I'm not going to yell on my own, Oggy, 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 you'd be thinking, Oi, 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 belonging together. 
And the same goes for those of us who'd be thinking and sound Ioni if I were to say Calon Lan. This notion of sharing, this is where it becomes exciting because the sharing is there for the taking. Learning a language at whatever stage, in whatever capacity, gives us a share of the memory that language holds, a share of the story. And this is what makes belonging. The adopted child belongs to the family not because of the legal papers or the blood and DNA, but because of the shared memories, the shared story. She was there when the key fell out from the attic, when a neighbor next door got a pet rabbit, when Auntie Non dyed her hair shocking pink, and Cousin Brynwall played for Wales. Same goes for learning a language. It offers a share of those memories, of that belonging, a share of that seat at that window, a share of the view. I'm not Spanish by any stretch, but having learned some of the language, I can, if I stand on my tiptoes, see at least a bit of the world through the Spanish window. Bilingual, multilingual. Remember, this doesn't necessarily mean that you can speak the languages equally well. I mean, in terms of Welsh, if you can say Llanelli, then you're already on the bilingual bus. And if you know that when you see a sign, something like this, and it doesn't mean that if you're called Alan, you must leave, then you're well down the line. We've got to open up our minds, folks. Take off the blinkers. Embrace what we're calling in education the multilingual turn. Give it a go. Relish the glorious language learning mistakes, like the time I told an eminent German professor at the start of a meal to behave himself instead of to help himself. And there have been many worse occasions. Perhaps more now than ever, we need to take the risks and take the view that language is made for seeing, yes, but also for sharing. And it is with this notion of sharing that I can finally answer my own question. What is Wales in Welsh? That word Cymru we mentioned right at the beginning. It has two components. Com brogos. This is not a translation of Wales. The etymology of Wales and Welsh is traced back to the sense of foreign or other. This is clearly a label given to us by somebody else. You don't call yourself foreign if you're at home. Cymru, on the other hand, here it is, the com and brogos gives us something else. Com, meaning together, and brogos, broadly meaning a piece of land. Cymru, the country, is therefore the shared patch. Cymru, the people, are those who share it together. What's Wales in Welsh? It's the together land. I love that. It's inclusive and embracing. Being Welsh is not a question of who was here first, but what was here first and who is sharing it here now, sharing the story, sharing the view from the window. So I'd like to finish with a piece I wrote last year, sort of in desperation, having been asked to try to convey to a non welsh speaking audience in Berlin, as it happens, what it is I see when I speak Welsh. It's an approximation because obviously to see the view in focus, you need the language lens. Perhaps it's a bit like looking through a net curtain. And as I invite you to draw your chair closer to the windowsill, I'll just point out that in Welsh, we hear smells and that the word for prince is tuasog, which doesn't come from the principal idea, the prime, the first, but rather I like to interpret from the verb to guide, or the kind of leading that is guiding, to us, within touching distance. Touching. Do you remember those days? Anyway, I think that should do it. So here goes. We're not afraid of flies. We say hello 
not hello. The jaw and the mouth go south and don't close around the nose. Hello, not hello. And we have two words for you. And my grass is blue. And the word for blue is glass, not glass. And that matters, for it never shatters. Because when I try really hard, I do my best blue. And when I'm sad, the little shoe hurts in a place where you don't know because the dirt's mine and that's fine. And I say yes in as many ways as there are questions. I listen on things. I hear smells, like the smell of smoke. And though I know that smother and choke are brothers, somehow I don't know you. I only know facts and you're not a fact, you're an act of being beyond just living and there's a word for living that's the same as dying and a poem is a song and it's the half of walking and I can't be afraid, only fear like a cough and a cold can be upon me and things that are told are said against and we talk always with, never to and a kutch is a hug and loud is high and when I go to sleep I don't mind the bugs though I go to the field of night where I wait to see a dream that will light the candle of my eye. And I'm savvy enough to have absolutely nothing. Things are just with me for now, borrowed perhaps, like the trainers I call daps. And when I see rain, I see old women with sticks. And if six is half a dozen, then 50 is half a hundred, and 40 is double 20, and 19 is four and 15. And if you wanna be the boss, you've gotta be the bridge because a prince is not a primo, but a guide and pride means strong. So friend, as my song comes to an end, let me say that when you call us foreign, we'll open a hand and invite you to join us for we're the people of the together land. Diwachamrando.